let us come let us adore you kneel down before you kneel down before you in your presence Lord worship
for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Lord, we thank you for your love on today. You've been such a great God to us. Brought us a mighty long way. Allowed us, oh God, to stand here on today to exalt your name on high. To let the world know that if it had not been for you on our side, we don't know where we would be on today. But we're here on today. We're here to lift up our hands. We're here to lift up our voices. We're here to stop our feet. We're here to give you a magnificent praise. Because we know you're worthy of all of our praise today. Lord, have your way in this place on today. Lord, we ask you to just move amongst us. Allow us, oh God, to leave this place better than when we came. So we can be a testimony. We can be a witness that we serve a mighty God. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Let's give God a hand of praise this morning. God has been great. Born on 
December 13, 1903, in Norfolk, Norfolk, Virginia. She grew up in North Carolina, developing a sense for social justice early on, due in part to her grandmother's stories about life under slavery. Baker studied at Shaw University in Raleigh, right, North Carolina. As a student, she challenged school policies that she thought were unfair. After graduating in 1927 as class valedictorian, she moved to New York City and began joining social activist organizations. In 1930, she joined the Young Negroes Cooperative League, whose purpose was to develop black economic power through collective planning. She also involved herself with several women's organizations. She was committed to economic justice for all people and once said, people cannot be free until there is enough work in this land to give everybody a job. Ella Baker played a key role in some of the most influential organizations of the time, including the NAACP, Martin Luther King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and the Student Nonviolent, Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. She was a field secretary and branch director for the NAACP, and also co-founded an organization that raised money to fight Jim Crow laws. But what was perhaps her biggest contribution to the movement was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC which prioritized nonviolent protests, assisted in organizing 1961 Freedom Rides, and aided in registering black voters. The Ella Baker Center for Human Rights exists today to carry on her legacy, and they believe the best way to honor Ms. Baker's legacy is to inspire people to imagine new possibilities, lead with solutions, and engage communities to drive positive change. We, we salute Ms. Ella Baker for her contributions to society. Amen. And those are your announcements. Amen. 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 We thank the Lord for Amen. continuously blessing us and being with us through our journey in life, knowing that he will always protect, knowing that he will always provide. And we know that no matter what we've gone through, God has provided for us. Amen. And so therefore, we use this time in our worship service to worship him through our giving. We worship him knowing that he has given to us what we do not deserve, but we give to him what he does deserve yeah. based on what the Holy Spirit has told us to give. So at this time, we're going to ask officers to come so that we may give unto the Lord. Those of you who are in virtual land, you can still mail in your offering at 19 Baby Street, San Francisco, California, 94124, or through the cash app at dollar sign Emmanuel Pearl Gate. Let us give unto the Lord. Jesus. 
the Lord. Amen. With this blessing me to have gone through what I have gone through. And I want to personally thank my church that has prayed for me. That prayed for me. Has been praying for me. Coming by to visit. Dropping off things. And, and Sister Barnes helped me. My sister helped me. And I'm just so grateful. But, but the greatest blessing is when I went to the hospital and the doctor, before we had the surgery, he got at the bottom of my bed and he held both of my hands and prayed for me. I knew I was in good hands. I heard about this man. I heard it from a friend that he was a Christian. But this doctor prayed for me, held my hand, and every person that I ran into at the hospital, at Washington Hospital, were Christians. And it was almost like I was in heaven. I had no worries. I had no worries about the surgery. I was afraid. But when I stepped out on faith in that hospital, the nurses, everybody was so positive. And the fact that in two weeks, I'm walking with double knee surgery. Some folks don't believe that. They can't believe that. They can't believe that. Uh, and, and the joy that I still have today, right now, after what God has done for me, I just give him praises. And some folks, it's, it's strange. I had a friend who says, why are you always praising God? I say, why am I always praising God? One, because I'm a man of God. Two, because I need God and he's been so good to me. And I just thank God that I'm going to let my light shine. I'm going to praise God everywhere I go. And I'm just so grateful and thankful. And I thank God for my pastor. And he told me he was a very wonderful inspiration because I didn't want to have it. I didn't want to have both of my knees done. He said, go ahead and get them both done. But you're going to go ahead and do it. So I just want to let the church know that I am so grateful and thankful for what God has done. And, and uh, my scars are just about healed. I'm able to walk. I'm able to dress myself. And, and I'm just overwhelmed with what God has done. And it's almost like when you touch the hem of his garment, I felt like I didn't touch the hem of God's garment. Because I feel whole lot. And it, it's, it's just so wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And I thank God for blessing me with a, a, a Christian doctor that I recommend, Dr. Dearborn. And I just thank God for him. I thank God for him putting God first before he even operated me, cut on me, chopped me up, and did all the things he had to do. So I just want to church, I wanted y'all to know how grateful and thankful I am. And I'm boasting in the Lord Jesus Christ. I just, I'm just so happy. Well, and, and I'm so happy I came to wear some shoes for you. I ain't worn two shoes five, six years. I got on some regular shoes. So thank you. God bless all of you. Continue to keep me in prayer. Thank you, Pastor.
thank you for all the things you've done. Yes. We come to you right now, not only to lift up your name, but we come to receive a word from you. Lord, we ask you right now to give us a word that will encourage us, that will enlighten us, that will allow us, oh God, to leave this place better than we can. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give God a hand of praise for all of you God is great. He's truly worthy to be praised. And praise God for each and every one of you who are here, each and every one of you who are tuning in. God has been so good to us. And we just cannot help but just thank him for all the things he has done. Amen. Let's take our Bibles at this time and let's turn to the book of Song of Solomon. Amen. Song of Solomon, chapter 1. And we're going to begin reading at verse number 2. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, beginning at verse number 2. The word of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ speaks to us as follows. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore do the virgins love thee. Draw me, we will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. The upright love thee. I am black, but comely. O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon, look not upon me, because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. May the Lord bless your reading and the hearing of his most precious word. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I'm going to use that scripture this morning to speak to you using the subject, you are so beautiful. You are so beautiful. Tomorrow is Valentine's Day. And it is the day where everybody goes out and spends all their money <laughs> to please the love of their life. Valentine's Day has been used as a day of affirmation to let your loved one know that you are thinking about them and that you appreciate them. Amen. Well, amen. Valentine's Day is mostly for the women. Amen. They, even though they may say Valentine's is just another day, amen. even though they may say you don't have to get me anything, even though they say, oh, you love me all year long, don't worry about Valentine's Day. Man, I come and tell you, don't fall into that trap. You better make sure you do something to let your woman know that you're thinking about her, especially on Valentine's Day. I used to believe that uh, Valentine's Day was an important. Matter of fact, I still don't like Valentine's Day. Uh, there's a story that when I first met my wife, on our first Valentine's Day, I actually told her, I said, look, I don't celebrate Valentine's Day, so don't expect nothing. You're not gonna get nothing. Because Valentine's Day is just a day for people to get money. And so if you can believe, she was hot. <laughs> <laughs> and to put wood in the fire, I told her a story. I said, well, what we're going to do
do is we're going to help my best friend out today. He's preparing to uh, uh, propose to his girlfriend, and so we're going to help him out today. And then you can imagine the arms start to cross. Steam start to go up in our head. I said, so what we're going to do, we're going to go downtown. We're going to go and help pick up the engagement ring. And then we're going to bring it over to his house. And I could see in her eyes, she was cussing me out. <laughs> All the way down there. Got to the boat where we were supposed to pick up the ring. Sat down. She said, why are we here? I said, we're just here to pick up the ring and go. The boat started to drift off. She said, where are we going? I said, I don't know. Let's go find out. <laughs> Went out on the deck. We're out in the middle of the water. And I pulled out a gift and gave her a $10 pair of cheap earrings. <laughs> and you can imagine the look on her face. She was pissed off. <laughs> and while she's looking at these cheap pair of earrings, I got down on my knee and proposed to her. What she doesn't know is, I still don't like Valentine's Day. <laughs> but I use that, I use Valentine's Day as our anniversary. Yeah. And uh, that's the Everyone seems to be looking for a Valentine. Because it affirms us of who we are through somebody else. But truth be told, the secret to a great and wonderful life is not finding a valentine in somebody else, but in finding a valentine within yourself. It is extremely important that you find a beauty within yourself because of whose you are and who created you. We must understand that we were made and created by God to be his children. Amen. We must understand that we were fearfully and wonderfully made. Is there anybody here who can testify that you belong to the Lord? That we are sheep in his pasture. Which means that not only does he guide us, but he also provides for us. He not only provides for us, but he takes care of us. Why? Because he loves us. And I wish I had anybody in the house who can declare, I love me some me. Not because of what I have done. Not because I am so great. But simply because God loved me first. Is there anybody here who can testify and declare, I'm not going to depend on anybody else to love me. I'm not going to depend on anybody else to support me. I'm not going to depend on anybody else to provide for me. Because I got a man by the name of Jesus. And as long as I'm a child of God, and as long as he's on the throne, he is all I will ever need. Is there anybody here who can testify? I know a man by the name of Jesus who has provided for me. I know a man supports my every need. Is there anybody here who can declare I know a man by the name of Jesus who will rock me in the midnight hour, who will comfort my grieving soul, who will allow me to be just who I am, who will allow me and declare to me I love you just the way you are. Is there anybody here who can tell a dying world I know a man Who's always by my side, who always picks me up, who always tells me I am his own. Is there anybody here who can give God praise and give God glory and declare, I know I'm beautiful because God tells me so? Here we are, we're in the Song of Solomon. It's a love. 
love story that involves dialogue between two people. Some people in the church tend to shy away from reading the Song of Solomon because of its content about sex and physical attraction. But we should embrace intimacy, especially when it comes to our God. For he desires intimacy from us. Our God wants us to have a deeper and more intimate relationship with him. He wants us to get so close to him that no one should be able to know where he begins and where we end. We ought to have such a close relationship with God. That no matter where we go, people can look at us and declare that we are his. Song of Solomon is a po poetic dialogue that involves sex and intimacy. But it's much more than that. Here is a conversation between King Solomon and a Shulamite woman. Solomon, he has about a thousand wives. And he has all of these wives, not for physical pleasure, even though he is a man. But he has these wives because that was his peace treaty method. He would marry the wives of kings and queens of different nations and different kingdoms so that he can have peace with them. But there was something about this woman from Shunem. There was something about the Shunemite woman that had Solomon on cloud nine. And even though in our lives God is a God of many, even though in our lives we know that God is a God of billions of people, we know that his attention is always on you. God says to you, I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nation. God promises, he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God declares that he shall supply all of your needs. Yes, there are over a billion people in this world and is there who can declare and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I am his own. Is there anybody who can proclaim on today God is my God. The Lord he is my shepherd and I shall not walk. Is there anybody here who can claim God as your own God and declare I wake up with God. I go to school with my God. I go to work with my God. I lay down to sleep with my God. Every single day of my life, I know that God is with me because he whispers in my ear every chance that he gets and lets me know that I am his child. This there's a few things that we discover in the Song of Solomon. The first thing we discover is the fact that this Shulamite woman is not a weak woman, but she's a woman of strength. For in the Song of Solomon, there's twice or even three times as many words from the Shulamite woman than Song King Solomon. And just like a woman she loves to talk. She knows the power of communication. She knows the power of having a conversation with somebody else. And the question is, how often do we spend time having a conversation with God? How often do we have moments of true worship with God? We ought to proclaim to God, I was weary, wounded, and sad. But I found in him a resting place. And he has made me glad. We must have 
a conversation with him. We must declare our sinking deep in sin, far from the distant shore. But the master of the sea, he heard my despairing cry. And now, safe am I. We should have a conversation with God. We should declare, where would I be if he didn't love me? Where would I be if he didn't care? I don't know why Jesus loves me. I don't know why he cares. I don't know why he sacrificed his life. But I'm so glad that he did. You have to have a conversation with God. Because that's the intimacy that God desires from us. What he doesn't want is when we sit in church and act like we don't need anything from him. As if we have it all together. As if we are independent and don't need anything from God. But I need somebody who can testify. I know how to get God's attention. I've got to tell him I'm lost without you. I've got to tell him, you are the air I breathe. I've got to tell him, it's in you that I live and move and have my being. I've got to tell him, without him I am nothing. Woman. She, she was a woman of strength because she was not shy about having a conversation. But she also knew how to let a man be a man. She knew that she needed him to be who he is. For she said, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. She didn't go after the kisses, but she let him come to her to give her kisses. We must understand that we need to tell God how much we need him. We need to tell God how much we need God to just be God in our lives. We must tell him how much we need God to take control of our lives. You see, some of us act like we don't need God and are incapable of allowing God to just be God. That's why we are in church with our arms folded, with our legs crossed, and with our lips tight, not able to say amen, not able to say hallelujah, not able to say, Lord, I need your help. But I need somebody who will declare, God, I can't go a day without you. I've got to let you be God in my life. God, you've been better to me than I've been to myself. God, you know that if I take control, I will fall apart. You know that if I take control, I will lose my mind. So I surrender all to you so that you can take the wheel of my life and just have your way. Is there anybody here who can declare, I need God? Just be God, for He is able to take control of my life. The Shunammite woman expresses in the text that she is infatuated with her man. It also expresses respect for his character and his reputation. She declares that his inner beauty was an aroma that attracted all the women. Because she respected his character, she would never do or say anything to do damage to his character. Marriage-eligible women today should have the same perspective, considering that the Apostle Paul summarized the responsibility of a wife towards her husband Ephesians 5.33 with one word respect and though it is common in the words of a modern film for 
women to select a man for who he almost is or to choose him for the man she can make him to be. This is an unwise thing. For an unmarried woman should I ask herself the serious question, can I genuinely respect this man as he is right now? Do I respect him enough to submit him to the way the Bible says a wife should submit. The maiden of the Song of Solomon had already asked and answered this question. For she said, I adore him. For his aroma attracts all the women. Therefore, a man and a woman, for that matter, shall always present themselves as someone worthy to be respected. How dare you be 30, 40, 50 years old and still walking around sagging your pants and showing off your underwear and demand respect under the same breath. How dare you be 30, 40, 50 years old wearing mini skirts and halter tops and under the same breath demanding for respect. How dare you be only concerned about whips and blank blank and Louis Vuittons and red bottoms uh, and not be concerned about family fortune, family legacy, and family values. Uh, and under the same breath, demand respect. It's true that you can't turn a boy into a man. It's true that you can't turn a prostitute into a housewife. Uh, you must present yourself with respect. Uh, and may I dare to say this morning, uh, that too many times we don't put enough respect on God's name. We treat God like a folk tale. We treat God like a genie in a bottle. We treat God like a Tylenol pill when something goes wrong. But I need somebody to declare He is Adonai. He is our Lord. He is El He is God. He is El Elyon. He is the God Most High. He is Elohim, the everlasting God, the Creator. He is Yahweh. He is I Am. He is El Shaddai, God Almighty. He is the Holy Spirit. He is the Lord. Of her 
man's attention. The self-doubt of the Shulamite woman regarding her own appearance should not be overstated. For she did feel in some ways unattractive and unworthy. For she says, don't look at me because I am dark. And how many times do we have this problem today? This constant fight that continues to happen over the hue of our skin. Still today, the favor of a person is dependent upon the hue of their skin. If a light skin or a lighter complexion, you get more privilege and more love. While the darker your complexion, the more hate you will receive. So it was in slavery time. The lighter your skin, you were allowed to serve in the master's house. And they were called the house Negro. While the dark skinned slaves worked in the field. And unfortunately, we still have the same reactions today, which divides our people and weakens us as a unit and a nation. Even in our spiritual lives, we are quick to declare, look not at me. This is an attitude very common to early Christians. For we don't want our natural life to be exposed. We walk around and we are afraid to give our life unto God. Because we are afraid of the darkness that has been surrendered and has been in our lives for such a long time. Thus, before being sufficiently dealt with by the Holy Spirit, immature believers and even veteran believers will tend to hide from others and say, don't look at me, for I am dark. And I wonder if there's anybody here who is right along with me who can declare, if you knew my darkest moments, if you knew what I have gone through, if you knew my deepest secrets, if you knew the thing that I have done that was wrong against God, you wouldn't want to sit next to me. You wouldn't even want to look at me. But thanks be unto God that I serve a God who forgives. That I serve a God who looks beyond my faults. And he only sees my needs. Is there anybody here who can for what I've done, but look at me for what God is doing in my life. For God is not through with me yet. And when God gets through with me, I shall come forth as pure gold. We become ashamed about what our lifestyles may have been. Or ashamed of the mess that we currently find ourselves in. Therefore, we call ourselves dark. But may I suggest to you that you must consider yourself lovely. This Shulamite woman called herself dark. Yet at the same time, she can say that she is lovely. Yes, she said she looked like the tents of Kadar, in which Kadar was a territory southeast of Damascus, where their tents were made of the skins of black goats. But she declared herself to be lovely. Yes, she stated that her mother's sons were angry with her and they made her the keeper of the vineyards and treated her with cruelty. But she declared that she was lovely. Yes, she seemed to make the mistake of thinking that her hardships have disfigured her and make her less qualified to be truly loved. But she declared about herself that she is lovely. Yes, she declared that her own vineyard she has not kept, which suggests that either she has not kept up her appearance or has not been able to keep her virginity. But she still declared about herself that she is lovely. The Shulamite woman expresses her dislike of her dark skin. But King Solomon has something different to say. 
He states in chapter 1, verse 15, Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful, for your eyes are like doves. He says in chapter 4, verse 7, You are altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. In chapter 6, verses 4 through 10, he says, You are beautiful as Terzah, my love, lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. Turn away your eyes from me, for they overwhelm me. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of mules that have come up from the washing. All of them bear twins. Not one among them has lost its young. Your cheeks are like halves of a pomegranate behind your veil. There are 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without number. My dove, my perfect one, it is the only one, the only one of her mother, pure to her who bore her. The young woman saw her and called her blessed. The queens and the concubines also, and they praise her. Who is, <clears throat> who is this who looks down like a dawn, beautiful as the moon, bright as the sun, also as an army with banners. And I need some saints in the house who can declare I've been in the dust. I've been in the mud. I've been broken. But God still sees me as valuable. Yes, I've made my mistakes. Yes, I've done my dirt. Yes, I still fall short. Willing to teach us how to care. 
doesn't know what God thinks. God says I am beautiful. God says I am valuable. God says that I am lifted up higher than the angels. God says one of these old days I'm coming back. I'm coming back for my church. I'm coming back for my bride. I'm coming back for the lovely ones. I'm coming back for the ones who are perfect in my eyes. Don't let the world tell you you're not worthy. Matter of fact, don't let anybody tell you you're not worthy. But God says, you are beautiful. This show of my woman teaches us and no matter what's going on around us, we must have an intimate relationship with God. Because it's God who desires to have an intimate relationship with us. How do we have an intimate relationship? We first accept Him as our personal Savior. We must ask Him to come into our lives, have control of our hearts, so he can have the reins of our souls. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Then we must spend time with him. Amen. Have conversation with him. Amen. Have deep kisses with him. Yes. Meaning staying in his word. Yes. Learning more and more about who he is. Yes. Learning more and more how he provides and supplies and protects for us. Yes. Yes. Then we can declare that he is ours and we are his. As we stand on our feet, is there anybody here who needs to have that intimate relationship with God? Who needs to declare, there's a time when I didn't feel like I was worthy, but now I understand that God sees me as beautiful. And he is just waiting to have an intimate relationship with me. If that's you, now is the time to give your life over to the Lord. Is there one?
brother man, don't make that mistake. <laughs> Please don't. Amen. 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 Do your due diligence. Please, 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 please be safe on today. This is Super Bowl Sunday and people are going, it's double. It's Super Bowl Sunday and it's Valentine's weekend. People are going to go crazy this weekend. So please be safe. Lock yourselves indoors. And just be one with yourself and your significant other. This world is crazy. You will do just about anything just because they're miserable. They want to make sure somebody else is miserable. So let's be safe. Trusting in the Lord. Yeah. And he will always provide for us. There isn't anything else. Glad to see each and every one of you. Happy Valentine's Day to each and every one of you. Remember, I love you. There's absolutely nothing you can do about it. There is anything else. Let us all stand so we can be dismissed.
Thank you. 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 Thank you.